What's up everyone? So this is video four. We're going to be talking about terms, specifically terms uh, relating to trees. So ternary trees, binary trees. We won't be going into ternary trees, but binary trees, yes. Um, the basic concept of a term is it's like a it's like a predicate that you can use inside of another predicate. So it's like an object that represents something. So let's say we have a family, right? Now, family consists of people, so we might have some variable person. Note that it's a variable variable because of capital P, and they might have some kind of job, right? Now, what person could be this variable person could be its own predicate called person. Note the lowercase p here, uh, name with a you know with a name. Right, so then we can rewrite family as person, let's say John, maybe in 37, who knows, and uh, let me just put in a job, so maybe John's a garbage man. So that's the idea. We're using a predicate, but it's not actually a predicate because it's called a term. We're using a term as an object that represents something. So in this case, he represents a person, which means that the variable person will be equal to that term. So the way this relates to trees, uh, let's just recall a tree here. So this is considered a tree. Uh, uh, so that's considered a tree, you know, it's just some some element with uh, subtrees or children. So this is a valid tree, just that, just that node, that's a valid tree. Its left and right subtrees would be void in this case, which means that they don't exist, they're nothing. Um, uh, and uh, every subtree, so the left subtree here and the right subtree here, are its own trees, right? So. If you want to look at the left subtree of this node, that would be that whole thing. If you want to look at the right subtree, it would be that whole thing. So that should just be a refresher. If you don't remember anything about trees, totally understandable, but I do have a video for that because I won't be covering any more about the basics of trees. We're just going to get right into it. So the first uh, conditional I want to write is member. Again, like we did in our last video, but this time we're going to be looking for the member of a tree. So we have three rules that we have to write out here. Uh, this top one will be our base case. So I want to do that last. Um, everyone does things differently, by the way. So if you like to do your base case first, by all means do it. Uh, so we're going to be looking for some element x, and it will be inside some tree with some root value, a left subtree, and a right subtree. Now remember that a left subtree is also a tree, right? So that means that this left variable and this right variable could very well represent trees of their own, right? Uh, the root element here, that will hopefully just represent some kind of value, like a number or a letter maybe, like a constant. We want that to represent a constant. All right, I didn't leave myself much space here. So let's take that one out for now. We'll go back. Let's make it blue. All right, so now we have our conditional. We want to do exactly like what we did with member um, from oh, my phone's going crazy. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not going to put it on the floor so it makes less noise. Um, we are going to do exactly like what we did with just the regular member with a list, except that our lists, you could say, are going to be left and right. So we're going to write this out again. Member of tree. We're still looking for x, but this time we're looking for it in the left subtree only, and that is it. So we're going to recursively go through 
the left side of the tree over and over and over and over until we hit our base case, which we will write in a second. But first, before we do that, we have another member of tree. We're still looking for X. We still have tree here. Root left, right. Okay. And you guessed it, this time we're looking on the right subtree. Member of tree, x, right. Now again, remember that right is its own tree, and left is its own tree. So when this recursively calls itself, putting hooking left, this variable left, up with this big tree term is totally valid. You can totally do that. All right, so now finally the base case. So we have x, and this will be the same again as our uh, previous member function. It works the exact same way. So that means that this tree that we have, we want to stop this when we find a tree with a root element x. Probably should have erased some stuff. I think that's legible enough. Right, and we can put a period at the end of this. Oops, I forgot a bracket. We can put a period at the end of this because as soon as we find that we have some tree, some part of the tree with a root element x as the same value as the variable x that we're looking for, we can just stop. Then it passes. Then we know for sure that x is a member of the tree that we're going through. So let's look at this in code. So we've got our base case member of tree looking for x we have tree and we have x we have our left subtree we have our right subtree right we can stop that there and then we have i'm actually going to copy this paste that paste that okay and we're looking for root left right Additional there, and then root left, right. Okay, and again, we're just going through the tree without really doing much of anything. So we're going through the left side, member of the tree, and we're going through the right side. Save that. Pile. Great. Okay. Now let's test this out. I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to write myself a query and I'll explain it, but these tend to be pretty long, so I'll cut out for a second. <clears throat> okay, let's go through this. <laughs> I know it looks a little long. It's a perfect representation of that tree. So we're looking for element 30 in this tree. We should not find it. Um, and here we're starting out our tree at node 97. Our left subtree is going to be 64. And then 64's left subtree is going to be 13. But then 13 has no more children. So 13's left subtree is just void. And uh, its right subtree is just void. And then 64 has a right subtree, negative 8, and then void, void again. And then we just do the other side. So I'm going to cut this, and I will paste it to here, and we will run. So 30 is not a member of our tree, so this is incorrect. So it, would, it wouldn't it would run, it wouldn't pass. But if we put in, let's say, 14, we run, yes, 14 is a member of our tree. Uh, let's try it again for negative 100 maybe. Run, yes, negative 100 is part of our tree. Uh, what about negative 1,000? No, so you guys get the idea. Okay, so this next example, we're going to try to find the positive numbers in the same tree. We're gonna use the same tree. Uh, since this one's a little bit tricky, I didn't really wanna write it out again. Uh, I think it would take too long if I explained it like that. So I want to just take some time to explain the code that I had already written. So this is our base case at the start. So if we have 
a void tree so if it's an empty tree which means you know like if we hit the very very bottom somewhere like here that would be void right and if n is zero then stop so there's a few things that could happen there the big one is if we just plug in a void tree um, then naturally the number that number of uh, of positive numbers would be zero God, what am I doing? There we go. Okay. Now, after that, we have positives with our tree. That's the tree that we're looking in. And n, n is not going to be anything. We're actually going to, when we do our query, we're going to plug in a variable. We're just going to say, hey, positives and then our tree, and then just put n at the end. Not an actual value or anything like that because prolog will find us a value. It will give us an n. It will tell us how many positives are in this tree. There are two conditions that we have to account for, two rules. One is when we encounter a positive number, as denoted here, when the root that we hit is bigger than zero, naturally it's positive. And if it's not, then it's just the other condition. So any other condition it'll hit that second uh, second conditional sentence here. So let's say our root is bigger than zero. We go through the entire left subtree, and then after that we go through the entire right subtree, and then once we're done that, our n will be whatever we find, m plus q, so it's the n's here. So of all the nodes that we hit, if we hit a positive one, we make sure to add one onto n for sure because we're counting positives only here right so we only want to add one onto our n count if we hit a positive so that's what that bits for now if we don't hit a positive that means that we've hit a negative right or I guess in this case <coughs> it could be zero as well but we're only counting positive and uh, positive numbers definitely positive numbers so when we're going through, we'll go through our trees again, our left tree and our right subtree, and n, remember n is here, n will be equal to m plus q, so it'll be equal to just, it'll be zero, I mean, essentially, because we're only counting positives again, right? So this one here will be added onto m plus q, only if we have a positive, but if we don't have a positive, it will just be m plus q, it'll just stay the same. So if we had found one positive before, then that number will stay the same because let's say m is one and q is zero, one plus zero is just, it's still one. So then n will continue to stay one. And that's that's how it can sort of maintain itself. So let's, uh, let's run this and take a look. All right, so that's in a new file. I think it's in my Google Drive. Um, here, and positive trees. Positives. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to write out another tree. I should have saved that last one. All right, so. I have our tree, it's the same one as before, and at the very end you'll see I've put in n. And this is where our count's going to be in prolog, so we're going to return how many positive numbers we have. So let's run that. We have five positive numbers, let's double check. One, two, three, four, five. That's fantastic. So what happens if we add another negative in there? We run that. Four. Exactly, we have four positives. So four is negative now, so we only have one, two, three. So that works. I know this part's a little confusing, but you have to just remember that you're only adding one onto your previous n, whatever it was, if you find a positive. So that's where this condition comes in. So you always want to account for everything when you have problems like this. You want to account for hitting a positive, and in this case you want to hit, uh, you want to consider hitting anything but a positive. So I hope that helps. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess thanks for watching. Uh, feel free to subscribe. 
Um, next video is going to be Crypt Arithmetic, I believe. And that will be it for now. I'll take a bit of a hiatus on this stuff just because uh, that'll be all the midterm information, all the midterm coverage. And I'll be starting up again after Crypt Arithmetic, uh, maybe in a couple weeks or something. We'll get into like uh, natural languages and stuff like that. So yeah, again, thanks for watching. Feel free to subscribe and happy studying.